Hi. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, great. Nice to meet you, Audrey. My name is Jason. Hi. And I'm, I have to say that I have done uh, some research about you in preparation for today, and I am a fan, so I apologize if I seem a little crazy because I am so uh, enamored by your work and what you do, so I'm honored to be chatting with you today. Really happy to be chatting with you as well. And as far as I understand, this is a pre-recording. So if there's any um, like uh, thing we need to re-record, I'm happy to do so. Oh, thank you for your cooperation. I know that you're very busy, so we're happy that you gave us um, some time today, and we're really happy to be doing this. Uh, before we start, let me make sure everything is okay on our side. Okay. Hello, nice to meet you. My name is Maki. Very and nice meeting you. Time for today. Excellent. So I think we're ready to start. Um, let me give you just kind of a run through as to how the interview will go so that you know what's happening. Um, this is uh, a family show geared towards family, but mostly for for young children, for, for children. So as you're answering, it might be the best if you keep your answers simple and kind of for kids. So children's children friendly as far as the depth of the answers goes. Uh, we have about nine questions first that I'm calling just quick questions. So it's a quick question and we would like some just quick answers, just whatever you think. They're mostly fun. And then there's a few questions that we want to spend some more time on um, after those. So we'll do the quick questions first. We have about 10 minutes for those. And then the rest of the time, I want to give you time to answer the questions as directly and as uh, thoroughly as possible. Okay. 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 Uh, just wanting to make sure the local crew is okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're fixing the cameras. So, just a second. Well, you look fantastic. So, you can be you can be rest assured that you look amazing. Okay. <laughs> Take, taking your word for it. <laughs> so I follow you on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm just so uh, I I love what you're doing, and I mm -hmm. love following, and I love your insights, and your you're very articulate, and you're very um, compassionate, and so I I really am so happy that I get to chat with you today. Yeah, they're fixing the cameras. There's three of them, one by one. So uh, I think we're about to start. We're about to start. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. <coughs> okay, so because this is a broadcast in Japan, we have to really focus on making sure that our answers and our words are easy words and easy to understand for a Japanese second language audience. So here we go. Uh, we'll start with the quick questions. Number one, when do you feel happiness the most? I feel happiness whenever I connect to someone that I didn't know before and have so much to learn with one another, such as this very interview. Excellent, thank you. So you're very smart and you know a lot of things. What is your weak point? Is there anything that you are not good at? I cannot feel a lot of rage or hatred or a vengeful feeling because of my heart condition when I was a child. I cannot get very excited either positively or negatively. Okay. Number three. What one item would you take with you if you were going to be on a deserted island alone for one week? I will take a hibernation pod currently under research that can put me to sleep for seven days. Excellent. Okay. What ability not held by humans are you most jealous of? I do not have any such jealousy abilities 
for other biological beings. I appreciate them having this ability, but do not want it for myself. Okay, excellent. If you were to meet an alien, what are some of the wonderful things about Earth you would want to show them? I would show Earth biodiversity, the various different marine and land species that Earth has in its ecosystem. Great. Okay, so on your tablet, uh, there's a circle and a triangle and a square. Which shape? Which shape do you like best? I like best this shape, which is three-dimensional and can fit through the three different shapes uh, that you just mentioned. Okay, why is that? Um, because this is a cylinder that has been cut on both axes. So in this side, it can fit through a triangle hole. On that side, it's a spherical hole. And on this side, it's a square. Excellent. If time travel were possible, what era would you like to visit? I would like to visit the here and now, which is the year 2021. Uh, in our interview. Maybe maybe this is time travel and you did come back to this moment. Excellent. It took me 39 years to get here to talk with you. I feel honored. All right. Uh, what would you do on your last night on Earth before your departure to Mars? I will get a full night's sleep, at least eight hours. Excellent. So what is your core essence? If we were to take everything away from you, what would be the last thing that would remain? Nothing will remain. Why do you say that? Because each and every word that I speak, including this interview, I publish to the Creative Commons or in the public domain so that anyone can take it to any direction. I relinquish the copyright of everything that I do, so there's nothing that I remain in control of. Okay. How about your, your values? Which was the last one that you think would remain? I think it's not my values. There are existing values such as sustainability and inclusion that I reached to when I was a child and will pass on to future generations. I'm merely a vehicle of these values. It's not mine. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so this is, <clears throat> these are the quick questions. Now my team is going to see if there's any that we want to come back to and ask a little bit more. So just one moment, please. Sure. I, I understand I we didn't take 10 minutes. <laughs> you, you're an excellent interviewer, excellent interviewee. あ、はい。で、その無人島はね、もう糸とか。オッケー、はい。で、えっと、あとこれ、えっと、火星 Ah, uh, oh, okay, okay. Where was it? Ichiban was? Ah, okay, okay, okay. So you said that, okay, we're ready. So you said that to feel connected to someone is when you feel the most happiness. 
Why is that? Because uh, the universe isn't just one perspective. As myself, I can only witness the world from one perspective. But connected with you, I can look through your eyes to a fresh perspective. And that always makes me very happy. So for you, you feel happiness when you're able to look through someone else's eyes and see their universe. That's right. And this is what I refer to as taking all the signs. Taking all the signs. Sides. Excellent. Like taking your side taking and their side. So the ability to see others' perspectives and other opinions is happiness for yourself. Yes. That's, that's amazing. I really like that. Um, you had said that your weak, point, your weak point was the inability to feel rage or to, to get angry about something. Do you think that's a bad thing? Sometimes uh, to get people focused on a social injustice, some sort of feeling of outrage may be productive so that people can think together about how to prevent something like that from happening again. So the, the, the empathy, the feeling of the, the same feeling Having the same feeling as people around you, whether that's good or bad, is actually something that you feel you're not good at. Uh, so if you feel happiness, I share the happiness very easily. If you worry about something, I can also worry about the same thing with you. But if you are very vengeful or if you feel a lot of hatred towards specific people or groups of people, I cannot easily sympathize with that feeling and it's one of my weaknesses. I see. So you're able to empathize with the positive side, but when it gets negative or emotional, in a negative way, it's difficult for you to share that feeling. I don't know. Worrying is also sometimes casted as negative. So this is not about positive or negative, but rather about my heartbeat. For you see, with my heart condition, when I was a very young child, the doctor said if my heartbeat uh, goes up, uh, like many um, heartbeats per minute, then uh, there's no sufficient oxygen in my brain and I will faint. And so this is more about excitedness uh, or upsetness rather than negative or positive. I couldn't feel a lot of joy as a young child either. So the extremes for you was what was difficult. That's exactly right. And when I become an adult and uh, the surgeons repaired my heart condition, I sought the very positive extreme feelings, um, actually going to Disneyland and so on as an adult. So I know the feeling of extreme joy, but I still don't know the feeling of extreme uh, negative feelings. Excellent, excellent. So you had said that there's no abilities by uh, animals or other uh, beings that you were jealous of their abilities of. Um, why is that? I think that's because if they are evolved uh, to have that ability, then I appreciate and make sure that there's sufficient biodiversity for these abilities to pass on to the next generations. But if I take it uh, for myself, then I don't think it's actually respecting the evolutionary path uh, that these biological beings um, initially had in the first place. So I will work with them, but I will not essentially take it uh, for myself. So the ability to fly or the ability to swim underwater for a long time, you respect as that creature's ability and you don't wish that for yourself, but wish to harmonize with that creature. That's exactly right, to learn from that creature maybe, but it's not my innate ability as a homo sapiens, as a human being. Maybe we can, for example, learn how to make um, airplanes that fly like eagles and so on, but it's not my personal ability. Excellent, excellent. Again, so so easy to understand and your, your thought process is so interesting for me and I'm so happy to learn. Um, let me make sure that this is all we have for the quick questions before we move on to the other ones. Not the one that I just 
あどっちだっけあ寝る寝ることねあそっかそっかそっかえっと OK OK two more so you had said that if you were if time travel was available you would fly to here and now to this interview in 2021 Are you not interested in the past or seeing what, was in the past, what the past was like or what the future will be like? I have been to the past. I traveled all the way from the year 1981 to here. Are you interested in seeing what was 1980 like or 1975 like? Well, we do have, of course, already、uh, plenty of documentaries and histories and so on、uh, in that era. So I already can see the、um, histories. On the other hand, if I do travel back there,、uh, then it runs the risk of me actually interacting and disrupting history as we know it. And so I've watched the movie Tenet.、Uh, it's probably not the best idea. I see. How about the future? Well,、uh, we are now moving into the future,、um, one second per second. So I'm happy that we will explore the future together. It's not me traveling to the future without you. So, together, we'll go together. Yes,、uh, the entire planet will go to the future together. Excellent. So, you had said that on your last night on Earth before departure for Mars, You would get eight hours of sleep.、Mm -hmm. How much do you usually sleep? Eight hours. So, in preparation for Mars, you would do what you can to keep the same schedule. That's exactly right, because when I am indeed on Mars, maybe after、um, a few months of hibernation,、uh, Mars will have a very different、uh, time schedule as compared to Earth. So while I am on Earth,、uh, I make sure that I still operate in Earth's schedule. And then when you go to Mars, you will adjust to Mars' schedule. Of course, Mars will have a different time of hour of the day. Excellent, excellent, so interesting. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to move into the other questions. There are, I believe, there are seven questions, and I want to give you、um, about five to seven minutes per question. So、um, I'll, I'll probably come in with some follow up questions during your answer, but I want you to feel free to. Really give us the full answer. Give us as much information and, and tell us as much as you want to as you can about each question. All right, the first question here we go. As an adult, looking back, were there any comics or animation series that influenced you as you were growing up? Uh, I'm influenced by the Japanese、uh, animation series、um, The Ghost in the Shell, the Neon Genesis Evangelion,、uh, and as a younger child, Doraemon,、uh, and these still are with me. As an older adult,、uh, I really enjoyed, for example, the animation、uh, Inside Out from Pixar. Uh, and just a few days ago, I watched、uh, Souls、uh, from the same studio, and they are also with me. Because、uh, in Inside Out, I think there is a really good portrayal of the modern understanding of emotions. That is to say, as a very young child, of course, each and every one of us tend to feel one dominant feeling at a time. But the thing about growing up, as portrayed in the movie, is that one can recolor existing memories so that it becomes a hybrid feeling. For example, if I feel a little bit upset, it's a tendency for me to mix some different teas together and drink it so that this、uh, joy is mixed with upsetness. Or if I really worry about something, I will listen to a new music, a new combination of music, again connecting sadness to hopeful feelings. I think all these are very important in the modern day because the social media on many platforms 
tend to spread the kind of message that evoke one dominant feeling uh, more often than not outrage. And so having the ability to essentially look at one's own emotional repertoire and not be over dominated by any particular emotion, I think is what we call emotional intelligence uh, around here and is one of the core things portrayed in the movie, um, inside out, I mean. Well, as for the uh, earlier comics like Doraemon, uh, it informed my understanding of AI and is indeed why I call AI assistive intelligence. For Doraemon, even though much more powerful uh, than other children uh, in the comic book, uh, nevertheless uh, offered the various options for the technology to work with the society, but Doraemon never um, in Terminator style uh, changed in a very disruptive way existing societies and the children after trying out those assistive technologies sometimes conclude that it does more harm than good actually most of the time uh, and then uh, what we are seeing actually is only the uh, things that are simple, easy to understand, easy to explain, and easy to adapt remain as staples in Doraemon, um, such as, well, the personal helicopter for flying around. But other than these, they don't tend uh, to disrupt the society that much. And that's what I believe about AI in the present era as well. So you said a few interesting things inside our head, the emotions inside our head. Um, something that I thought was really interesting about that movie was that the gender of each of the emotions for the main character, for the girl, the gender of some of the emotions were different. And then when there was the part in the movie where they were showing the, the voices for other people, the women had all women voices and the men had all men, but the main character inside her there were a couple of boys and there were a couple of girls. And I thought that was so interesting. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think gender expressions uh, is what many adults feel that in order to express certain emotions, one have to conform to certain stereotypes. On the other hand, uh, as you have just pointed out in the movie, there's really nothing inherent about any particular emotional expression that need to fit particular gender stereotypes. So I think the movie is brilliant in pointing out that gender stereotyping is actually orthogonal or unrelated uh, to the emotional expressions. You can be uh, very boyish or girlish, but you can also try different expressions for uh, some time of your emotions based on your interaction pattern with the environment or based on the person you're talking to. I agree, I agree. And you also you also talked about Doraemon and his experience. And you said AI, which mostly people associate with uh, artificial intelligence, but you said it was assistive intelligence. Uh, why do you think that Doraemon was assistive intelligence? Well, certainly we can see Doraemon respects uh, what's the best interest uh, for the children uh, that Doraemon interacts with. Instead of taking over their life's agenda, Doraemon is there to help them to fulfill their life's agenda. And this is what we call value alignment. Just like my eyeglass here helps me to see better because I want to see better. If the eyeglass here instead show a pop-up advertisement that I have to count to 10 to close, then it's aligned to the advertisers and not to my best interest. Interest. The other thing is that the Doraemon gives a full account of how exactly the different technologies work uh, in the society. And if it's not aligned, then Doraemon is happy to uh, change that or even to take it back, as we see in many episodes in the comics. And that shows the accountability of technology providers. If my eyeglass is broken, I can fix it myself or I can take it to a nearby repair shop. I'm not bound by any contract or something to keep wearing the eyeglass even when I don't want to. Excellent. So uh, you, you mentioned a couple of specific things in Doraemon about uh, the Takekopta and uh, different episodes. Was there any episodes of Doraemon that you remember now? Um, any specific episodes? 
I remember many episodes and also movie length uh, explorations like back to the Jurassic uh, era uh, exploration uh, with the dinosaurs and so on and I enjoy all of them very much. What's, what's your favorite Doraemon episode? I don't have one. I think I understand the Doraemon setting uh, in a more holistic way. So it's less about focusing on specific episode, but about the particular ways that Doraemon interacts with the society around it. Yeah, Doraemon, he's been around for a long time, and I think that he's a staple in Japan. I, I want to try Dokodemo Doa. How about you? What of Doraemon's tricks do you want to try? Um, so, of course, I um, enjoy the same food, the same dessert uh, that Doraemon enjoys. Um, but I don't know the Japanese word for it. In Mandarin, we call it Tong Luo Shao. <laughs> what, what, what kind of dessert is that? Uh, let me look up the Japanese word. There's a Doraemon movie actually just came out recently, I think, here in Japan. Yeah, so uh, the dessert is called Dorayaki. Uh, it's the same ah. prefix as Doraemon. Ah, Dorayaki. Ah. Yeah, I, I enjoy about, Dorayaki very much. Dorayaki. How about drinks? Um, drinks. Uh, well, I usually drink tea, as I just mentioned. Uh, this, I think, is green tea, but I also sometimes drink bubble tea. Bubble tea and green tea. Excellent. Hi. So we saw that you actually dressed up as Doraemon once. Yes, uh, and uh, it's very popular. I did this, <laughs> and uh, being authentic didn't show my fingers uh, in the film. So why did you decide to dress up as Doraemon? Because uh, it is a recruitment film, actually, for uh, young adults uh, who just graduated from undergrad to serve as what we call the digital transformation ambassadors uh, who can go to the small and medium enterprises and the social entrepreneurs and help them to digitally transform and show ambassadorship, meaning that they bring these digital thinking uh, into existing social configurations. So the idea is that one would inspire them to serve as kind of like Doraemon uh, to the local communities. Excellent. That's a great way to show interest. So Doraemon is a Japanese anime. Do you think that there is a reason why Doraemon came out of Japan culture? I think uh, in Japan, each and every um, spirit uh, can be imbued in everyday objects in mountains, in rivers, and so on. So there is this uh, wide acceptance of ordinary things taking sort of a life of its own uh, and interact with the human society. It's less likely uh, to imagine that in other like more monotheistic uh, cultures uh, where this idea of spirits around us is less prevalent. In Taiwan, we are also uh, very much believing that each small hill, each stone, for example, can also be a spirit. So we relate more easily with the Doraemon worldview. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, next question. That was excellent. Thank you. Next question. In, in 20 years, what do you think the most aspired job of children will be in the future? So now the most aspired job among Japanese kids is like, they want to be an idol, they want to be a game creator, or a YouTuber, or an artist. What do you think those aspired jobs will be in 20 years? I think the most aspired job uh, will be what we refer to here as a slash. So people could be a YouTuber slash uh, artist slash game creator um, slash maybe digital minister uh, and so on. <laughs> so the point is not in any particular job but in the ability to fuse between multiple jobs together. I think what we are witnessing now 
is that the barrier between the different siloed um, disciplines, every uh, kind of tasks and jobs in the society is being blurred and people are looking for uh, other people who can connect in a cross-discipline transcultural way across different um, silos and different places and so on and to figure out something together across existing job definitions and so uh, Today, uh, we still see many people think of the education uh, or the career ladder as a linear thing, but more and more people are doing zigzags across different sectors because all the um, important problems facing our society, such as climate change or tackling the pandemic and infodemic and so on, cannot be solved by one discipline alone. All the different uh, disciplines need to work together and people who can uh, visit easily uh, throughout those disciplines who can translate the insight from epidemiology uh, to uh, the media studies uh, to politics to poetics and so on uh, these are will be the most aspired to job not only uh, 20 years down the road but also you can start preparing now so you think that the combination and the connection of different genres and different abilities is actually what going to be people's uh, what people will bring will be aspiring to in the future and connecting and zigzagging between disciplines and uh, fields is what's going to actually be a aspirational jobs in the future. Yes, currently uh, when children aspire to particular jobs, it's like looking to the sky and identifying with one constellation or the next. Uh, what I was referring to is zigzagging, choosing the stars that are more aligned with your direction and forming your own constellation. Excellent. So you believe in the future it won't be one job, it'll be I can do three jobs and I'm A slash B slash C. That's exactly the point, yes. So what do you think society will be like in 20 years? I think people will not be defined by particular majors uh, that they graduated with. They will not be defined by one full-time job that they hold. They will not define each other in terms of easy to apply labels or even stereotypical uh, roles uh, in the society. Rather, people will connect to other people with similar values and each and every one of us hold a complex set of values that if communicated well enough, we can always find commonalities despite our different positions so that we can innovate to solve large structural issues together with common values. So rather than connecting through skills, you're connecting with values. With shared values, yes. With shared values. Why do you think that's important for the society in the future? Because as a society, we're now more and more understanding the repercussions of our actions. And most of the problem that we face, for example, a warming planet, uh, none of us can solve it by ourselves. So if we do not form partnerships in a planetary scale, none of the truly major problems could be solved individually or just by people in one discipline. So that is not just a good to have, it's a must have configuration for the society. So in your opinion, you believe that problems like uh, climate change you just said uh, will be solved not only by scientists, but by people of all disciplines working together, artists and poets and scientists and teachers and people working in, uh, in technology. It would be a a combined effort that will be able to solve problems like this in society. Definitely. I know a game designer uh, that designed a game that won the Taiwanese presidential hackathon last year, and it's basically an adaptation of the Japanese app Maimitsu uh, that shows the refillable drinking fountains uh, near oneself. But they added to it a Pokemon Go-like mechanism so that if you keep checking in and refilling your bottles and understanding 
how to combat climate change, uh, you can earn coins and redeem it to uh, understand more about the local specialty drinks from the agricultural products, from the social entrepreneurs and so on, and you get more push notifications that you're going to, uh, for example, at risk of heat damage, so you should uh, fill your bottle and drink more. And when people engage with this game for 50 days, then they make a new habit of refilling their bottles rather than buying new plastic bottles, which reduces the plastic waste as well as lowers the chance of climate change. So you believe that in the future, successful students will be people who can combine more different, more, more fields and more areas together to combat a certain one problem. That's right, and form their new constellations. Excellent. So that's actually like programming. Yes, it is a sort of design, yes. How is that like programming, do you think? Uh, so in design thinking, we need to first explore to discover what other people's feelings are and then we need to define together the common values that can unite us in collective action. So that's the first diamond in the double diamond view of design thinking. Now the second diamond, which is more about computational thinking, is about dividing the task so that multiple teams can work on it concurrently uh, and then uh, converge together into a final um, solution. But the solution is not actually final. It is just a beginning for another round of feedback and design thinking so that the design thinking and computational thinking follow one another in tandem. Excellent. At the same time, so it's it's finding your common goals, defining your common values, and then dividing the tasks and then working together. That's exactly right. Excellent. So in this case, which is more important, a specialist or a generalist? I think it is a generalizing specialist. A gen <laughs> combining both of them. Yeah, someone who is specialized in many things. That's right, just like the triangle, square, and sphere, a uh, three-dimensional object that I just showed you. Excellent. I really appreciate the way that you are thinking out of the box, as we say in English. You're thinking out of the box, you threw the box away, and you're just using your open mind, and I really appreciate that. Okay, next one. Currently, and looking into the future, what are some elementary school subjects that we don't have yet, that in the future you think will be a part of elementary school curriculum? Curriculum design. Curriculum design, all right, tell me about that. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, we are now working with a new curriculum that very consciously leaves a few hours every week for the student to draw up their own curriculum so that they can, uh, what we call it, purpose-based learning, uh, they can engage with this kind of PBL to find their own purpose and work with the school which has a curriculum development committee uh, that has student representatives in many schools. And so the student has a way to participate and change however they want the school-defined curriculum, how it works. So if the students collectively want to learn philosophy, uh, even though there's no such um, element in the curriculum, they can actually work with their teachers and start philosophy classes. Uh, the same goes for, for example, eSport uh, or really any other uh, out-of-the-box thinking. So this participatory um, democratic uh, design of curriculum is what we are looking at when we're empowering our next generation who often know better what they are wanting to learn instead of we as curriculum designers. So with the curriculum design theory, students will propose what they want to learn, yes. what they want to know more about. That's right. And then present that, and the teachers, then the school, the administration creates curriculum and uh, learning a learning space for them to learn what they want to that, learn. That's exactly right. So they become co-creators, not just consumers of curricula. Co-creators 
and not just consumers. I like that. Why do you think that's important? Because the world changes faster than we can anticipate as curriculum designers, and the world changes literally every second. Uh, at our curriculum, uh, we change the structure only once every decade or so. So it's almost inevitable that it feels outdated the time that it really hits the schools. And so we deliberately um, made sure that the uh, uh, schools work with the student, not just for the students, to uh, shape their learning so that whenever there's any emerging thing, for example, the sustainable development goals um, or the pandemic, uh, and then the school's curriculum can reflect that in real time instead of waiting for another 10 years. So it's more time sensitive. Mm -hmm. And more uh, respective uh, of the um, choices of the student that may have before uh, they can only choose this school or the other uh, which interprets the same curriculum in different way but with them as co-creation uh, partners in the school they can actually work through their school curriculum design community to make sure that the next uh, grades uh, the younger people who enroll to the same school can also benefit from the lived experience of the students that came before them and participated. So we just talked about what we think maybe will come in the future. Do you think there's anything in the current curriculum that will not be in the curriculum in the future? Well, I think currently in the curriculum, we already focus on the competence instead of just literacy. For example, we talk about media competence, the ability to produce your own media and the journalistic standard that need to be associated with it. But there are still some points in the curriculum that talk about literacy, which is foundationally about um, a one directional, like listening to radio, watching television and things like that. Because truth to be told, there are still such broadcasting televisions in our society, including this very one that we are speaking speaking on. Uh, but in the future, I think most of them will be um, what we call a multicast, meaning that people can talk to uh, various other people without necessarily the intermediary of TV stations or radio stations. And at that point, I think media literacy would be gone and replaced entirely by media competence. Media literacy will be replaced by media competence. What about subjects like math or reading or science, do you think those subjects would be around in 20 years in the elementary school curriculum? I think uh, mathematics will remain. I don't know about math. Okay, mathematics will remain. What about uh, science or history or linguistics? Yeah, because to me, math, uh, when I was elementary school children, math is about doing hand calculations. But I was already programming computers back then. So math, as in calculations, feels irrelevant because I can just apply the mathematical knowledge that I learned and have the computer do the, well, computing, right, the calculation. And so uh, I think this has been happening for a long time. And nowadays, uh, we are OK with students taking calculators, for example, to uh, mathematics examinations. And so um, in the future, I think there will be less of these math, like uh, hand calculation sort of thing. And the same applies to the other sciences as well. There will be less chores, less uh, rote memorization. There will be more co-creation. Less memorization, more creation. Excellent. What about uh, linguistics, foreign languages, history? I think uh, to learn about a different culture, that is still essential and it will remain. Uh, but uh, the memorization of another language, maybe that will be augmented by assistive intelligences such as machine-based translation. Excellent. So in your experience, you actually have probably created curriculums yourself, mm -hmm. yes. for yourself and maybe for others. How has the how has that results? How have those results been? 
Uh, pretty good. Uh, I was one of the members of the National Development Committee of the K-12 curriculum uh, that took effect a couple years ago. And by far, I think we switched from a memorization or literacy-based curriculum structure to a competence-based uh, structure. And the upshot is that the middle schoolers, even primary schoolers, many of them are enjoying uh, the freedom of being a media, being uh, able to raise, for example, e-petitions uh, that successfully petitioned for, for example, banning of plastic straws in our bubble teas uh, and other <laughs> single-use utensils uh, gradually uh, and uh, in our national petition platform uh, at a, this very mo moment that there's more than one quarter of petitions being raised by people who are not yet 18 years old, people who don't um, have the right to vote in representative democracy are definitely still very active participants in our participatory democracy. And also, I think because of this competence-based learning, they are petitioning not just for their own benefit, uh, but for the planetary health, uh, as uh, can be evidenced by seeing the banning of plastic straws, by putting a cap um, on the carbon emissions of the lunches in school and things like that. Excellent. So it sounds like I'm just shocked that one fourth of the petitions being raised are by school children who are yes. less than 18 years old. That's right, by school children. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So they're, uh, they're taking an act, a proactive part in their own future. That's right, uh, and this is only possible because their civics teacher sometimes uh, even assigned this as the homework, like find a social or environmental issue and start a petition about it is literally the assignment of many civics classes in basic education now. Wow, that's amazing. You should be proud of yourself for starting such, a, such an amazing future. Okay, next one. So now we're going to shift to a little bit more personal. So right, you, we've talked about your professional development and professional achievements. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of your personal um, experiences. Um, are there any regrets or mistakes that you made as a child? Um, I heard that uh, in, in, in some interviews and watching that you, felt that, the, that you said there was times that you felt like you didn't fit in. Um, and I know how that feels for my own reasons, but uh, when did you feel like you didn't fit in? Yeah, uh, for example, when I was a child, um, I would uh, attend a math class, but I wouldn't pay much attention to the hand calculations for I already know how to program. And when, for example, in the first grade in primary school, the teacher was explaining addition, right, X plus Y, uh, like four plus five is nine or something. Uh, I was saying that uh, it's only nine if you count in decimal, but what if you count in binary? One plus one would be one zero, uh, and so on. Uh, and the primary school uh, teacher simply asked me to please visit the library during the math classes and not disrupt uh, the learning of my classmates. And that, of course, made me feel that I don't quite fit in. So you felt like academically you were at a different level, so you didn't fit in. That's right, but I fit in uh, with a librarian, that's just fine. You fit in with a librarian. That's right, they would uh, suggest what to read. <laughs> they would give you ideas for books. Oh, that's right, and I learned about the Dewey Decimal Numbering System. In first grade? That's right. Wow, okay. So then, um, what advice would you give to the younger yourself? It sounds like you had a, had a kind of hard time in the classroom. So if you could talk to the younger Audrey, what, what advice would you give to the, to the first grade Audrey? Uh, well, that there is uh, a very large world out there on the internet and instead of trying to fit in like literally with the same class of uh, young children, there's a lot of very interesting interest groups uh, on the uh, internet and one can very easily fit in no matter how um, obscure one's interests are. So you felt like if you could tell yourself you know, don't worry about fitting in in this classroom because if you look online, you're going to find people that are the same as you. Exactly. Excellent. So, um, 
what other struggles did you have as as a young as a young person growing up? You said you struggled in math class, but what else did you struggle with? Um, when I was in the second grade in primary school, uh, I consistently placed the first place uh, in examinations. Uh, and the person who consistently scored on the second place gave me a really hard time about it and bullied me uh, along with some other classmates. It turns out that they will um, actually get punished if they don't score um, the first place. And so their uh, like personal sense of worth is built on something that's very unstable. Uh, and so uh, I quit uh, the primary school for half a year on the second half of the uh, second grade. Uh, and then I read up on a lot of, for example, Montessori, Piaget, um, many uh, Sapir, uh, many psychologists that specialized in children's psychology and learned uh, why those people were bullying me. And of course, once I quit uh, the primary school, uh, the person who used to score the second place now scored the first place. So, uh, but it doesn't really mean that they learn more. Uh, it's just that their sense of worth uh, has been appeased. Uh, so I think this is also one of the places where instead of trying to fit in, I would instead want to understand the entire structure and the structural issues that came uh, because, for example, of the parental expectations that were misplaced. So you were in second grade, you quit school because you were being bullied by the person who wanted to be the top, you were always the top studier, mm -hmm. top, the top score. That's right. And rather than studying things from school, you studied psychology because you wanted to understand why this person was acting this way. That's exactly right. And also, uh, I put that in the curriculum that I helped design a couple years ago so that there will never be student to student uh, competitions and the relative score in the classes would never be taken, uh, for example, by the graduation requirements uh, of the universities and so on. So did you feel that studying psychology helped you? Yes, definitely, because uh, if I don't understand the situation and I would not be able to propose something that will prevent this um, injustice uh, from happening again. So once you were able to understand the psychology of what was happening with the other students and with yourself, did the bullying stop? Yeah, definitely, because I changed to another school. Um, you see, I uh, okay. attended three kindergartens, uh, six primary schools, and one year of middle school before I dropped out. Uh, oh, okay. Three kindergartens, six elementary schools, and then junior high school was just... One year. One so, year so I, so I never um, did uh, what we call uh, the summer homework because I was just changing schools all the time during every summer. What was that like? Um, so it's, um, as I mentioned, it means that I constantly connected to new people and learned new perspectives. So for you, that was a, a plus then? Yeah, it is something that's very exciting because instead of just a linear path of uh, understanding the society, I could uh, in Germany or in Taipei or in New Taipei City and so on, uh, see the world through various different perspectives. I love that idea. Okay, so let's go to the next one. I, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm flying to this, but I'm just learning so much. Um, uh, in your opinion, is there anything that the world views as good, but you think is not good? Oh, according to the theme. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, that's the next question. I skipped one. Um, uh, what do you feel is necessary for someone to achieve their dreams? Uh, they need to have sufficient amount of sleep. Sleep. Why is that? If you don't sleep well, you don't have dreams, period. Uh, and then uh, if you don't sleep in, with a good quality, you don't end up remembering your dreams in a consistent way. And if you don't sleep well, you don't have the energy during the day to achieve the dreams. Sleep. That's. Do you sleep well? Yes, I sleep very well. Uh, I slept <laughs> for eight hours. I already mentioned that. 
That's good. I, I too, I don't function if I don't sleep. So I, I can, I can hundred percent see where you're coming from. <laughs> sleep. Excellent. Okay. So back to the question I just started. Um, is there anything that the world views as good, but you think is not good or even bad in our society? Yeah. I think putting extra waking hours to work is sometimes, especially around our corner of the earth, as uh, showing diligence and so on. As a school children, uh, one is re recommended to finish one's homework, even though it means putting extra hours and cutting down on sleep. But the truth is, um, if you don't sleep for a sufficient number of hours, you don't remember those homeworks anyway. Uh, and so, uh, for people who show diligence by putting extra hours and uh, sacrificing some of the hours for sleep, I think that's actually a very bad thing. So the the stigma between uh, working a lot and studying a lot and sacrificing sleep is something that you view as not good. Yeah, if I need to work very hard uh, and integrate various different perspectives into a coherent understanding, I would put extra working hours to my sleep. I would sleep for nine hours or even 10 hours. And that uh, is a much more healthy way to do uh, problem solving. Okay, so you believe to sleep more, you, you can accomplish more. What about kids who don't finish their homework? Uh, I think if you finish only, say, um, three quarters of your homework, but you sleep very well, chances are you will remember those three quarters much more and much better uh, than if you finish all of it but didn't sleep well. So you believe that finishing as much as you can but getting proper sleep is more important than finishing the assignment and getting less sleep? That, that's exactly right. Okay. Excellent. What if you were the teacher and the student gave you a, the, the, the homework and they were only halfway done or three quarters of the way done, how would you view their work? I would say that uh, they put in a extra care to themselves and I would uh, commend them for it. So what if they did three quarters of their work um, but didn't finish their homework, but it wasn't because of sleep, they just stopped doing their homework? Well, I would find out what was interfering uh, with their sleep. For example, if they are addicted to touch screens, then I would recommend that they maybe interact with the touch screen, not through their fingers, but through a stylus or a keyboard, uh, which to me consistently improve my quality of sleep. Tell me about that. So uh, if I uh, use the touch screen too much, then my brain thinks the screen is an extension of my body. Uh, and then uh, when I start to swipe it, sometimes I couldn't finish swiping it. It feels more like the screen swiping me rather than me swiping the screen. However, if I interact through a stylus uh, like this uh, or a keyboard, then it's always intentional, meaning that I have to think about what I want to do before I do it. Uh, and therefore, always it's uh, a computer is by itself and I'm by myself. We're in a partnership, but we're not uh, sharing the same body, so to speak. And so I would not uh, build up the addiction that makes it uh, harder for me to enter the state of sleep during the night. So you think that if you use your touch screen less, that your quality of sleep will improve? That's right. If I touch the screen less, then I sleep better. So in Japan, there are some people that don't sleep and just keep working. What do you think about them? Um, I think, uh, of course, if they are born with this ability, uh, then I applaud this inbuilt ability. <laughs> but uh, for myself, I don't really learn things if I don't sleep. Excellent. That's even something to do, so. So I'm, I'm really interested in your theory about uh, the touch screen and the phone. Do you, do you have a, a smartphone? I do have a smartphone, but I use a stylus to interact with that phone. So it's like a pencil. So for example, I also have uh, my working device uh, is an iPad. 
uh -huh. but as you can see, my primary interaction with it is through this keyboard or through this stylus and instead of a touch screen. I only touch the screen uh, when I'm zooming something in or zooming something out, but only very briefly. Excellent, excellent, thank you. So with online communication progressing, in your opinion, what new types of people will become leaders? I think uh, they are the people that can work across disciplines, across different cultures, and across generations. Why is that? Because the network connects people previously who do not live in the same neighborhood together based on the common values. But if you connect to people who live a very far distance away from your home, chances are the culture will be different. And instead of people in the same class, the age may be very different as well. And it is essential that instead of seeing things in only one perspective, one can entertain the different perspective uh, drawn by different disciplines and so on. So a transcultural cross-discipline intergenerational attitude is necessary to get anything done. Otherwise, we are not truly connecting to people, much less leading the people. So a good leader then, in your opinion, is connected to people and more than leading, they're actually connecting to people. That's right. And also being able to, as I mentioned, take all the sides of people. So a good leader then will be able to be empathetic and connect to a wider group of people in the virtual realm and online communication. That's exactly right, because there's more diversity there, so inclusion is much more important. The inclusion. So in your opinion, the new types of leaders will in the, in the online communication world are the ones that are able to include as many people as possible. That's right, uh, as long as they share a common value, of course. Sharing common values. Excellent. So is that just in the progressive internet community or in society? Well, I don't think there's much of a difference now in places where broadband is a human right. Everyone can bring some of the online dialogue to the face-to-face -face communication as easy as opening a uh, telecommunication tool on their phone, right? So because of that, I don't think there is a uh, hard delineation between the internet community, quote-unquote, and the face-to-face -face interaction. We're now much more integrated than before. Very integrated. Excellent. Yeah. So what about people who are not as skilled as speaking in front of people, but they could do you think someone like that would be able to be an online leader? Definitely. Uh, people who are specialized in speaking to a camera by themselves can nevertheless pre-record certain interviews and certain ideas and enjoy the feedback asynchronously, that's to say not in the same time, uh, but nevertheless being very eloquent in uh, listening at each other. And I think that's the main benefit of internet is not just to transcend the places, but also to transcend the time so that people in different time zones do not need to like wake up 24 hours a day, but they can nevertheless uh, replay the critical interactions and offer their take on it. Excellent. We're running short on time, so I have one more, one more question for you, and you can keep it short if you would like to. Um, what message do you have for the children of Japan? I know that it, we've talked about a lot of things today, but what message do you have for the young people in Japan, for the, for the youth of Japan? I would quote my favorite Lena Cohen poem uh, that says, There is a crack, a crack in everything, and that is how the light get in. Is there anything else you would like to add to that? Uh, and I wish you all live long and prosper. <laughs> Excellent. Let me make sure that we got everything we need before we let you go. I realize that your time is so valuable. Let me just make sure that we have everything we need okay, before we okay, say Okay, okay, of course.
Well, do you have any questions for us? Uh, I think we're all good, uh, and I'm really enjoyed this interaction. You're a excellent uh, interviewer. Oh, thank you for saying that. I like that. I I am your online stalker, so if you see me in your followers, you'll know that it's me. Okay. Jason. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're you're a, a stan, right? A stalking fan. Yeah. Yes, I'm a stalking fan. I'm a stan. Yeah, I'll I'll be your stan for a while. But it was so nice talking with you. Um, because of you, my day is off to an amazing start, and I I really think that this is going to be a powerful message for the viewers here in Japan, and I'm really thankful that you made time for us today, and uh, I'm honored that I was able to talk with you. My team is right here, so they can, you probably want to peek in and say hi as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you, the team, for uh, putting it all together. Uh, arigatou gozaimashita. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to pass the torch back to the producers and directors, but it was very nice chatting with you. Have a good day. Have a good local time. Bye. 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 Bye.